Okay, welcome everyone back to um, Math 275. I'm trying a little experiment here with, uh, with um, dual monitors. Please bear with me to see if this works. My problem is getting both the gallery and the shared screen to show at once, which I don't seem to be able to do. Um, hang on a second here. There should be a, a button in the top right corner that says gallery view. Okay, maybe that's not possible at the moment. So let me just grab this here. Okay, great. So um, uh, any, any questions or th thoughts before we get going for today? Please feel free to unmute and speak up at any time. Um, I noticed not too many people have posted to the Slack channel yet. It would be really um, helpful, I think, for a lot of people in the class if everybody just like like um, uh, appeared once on the Slack channel. It would also help me know that people can get access to it. Uh, it's a nice place um, maybe to get some discussions going uh, outside of class. Um, did anybody have difficulty accessing the Slack channel? Um, I, I did when I tried clicking the link on the website. I'm not sure if it's just me or not. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Did anybody else have difficulty? Yeah, I, I did as well. Okay, so um, what happens if you go through uh, Canvas and then to Slack? Because I know some people were able to get to Slack. Um, maybe it's too much to ask to go straight to Slack from the web page. Um, can you try that, Grant? Uh, yes. Where is it on Canvas? So it's in the. If you go to the Canvas page, there's a list of things on the side. The Zoom is at the top, and then Slack. It just says the word Slack on the side. I hope. From the way you're looking, I'm. I'm <laughs> <laughs> Oh. Yeah, uh, I see Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so underneath, let me just see what uh, I see. Sorry for having to digress on logistics. So I see Slack right under Zoom. Let me just see if I um, if I go to student view, if I still see that. Yeah, I, so in my student view, I see actually syllabus, Zoom, and Slack on their left-hand side. Oh, I'm on the wrong class. <laughs> <laughs> It worked. It worked? Okay, great. So <laughs> probably I'm misleading people by putting the link on the, on the main page. Uh, so I'll send around an e email just reminding people to weigh in again. Okay, any anything um, else, logistic or otherwise, before we get going? Uh, could you um, have the meeting show up in the calendar on Canvas? In the calendar on Canvas? Uh, sure, I'll try to figure out the to do that. Um, just curious, how, how does that work? How does it, and how does it help? Uh, well, if you have all of the meetings, um, like on the calendar, you can uh, go, go to the Zoom meeting through the calendar. And you oh, have I see. So you have one calendar that has all of your course meetings on it? Uh, yep. Okay, I gotcha. I will, I will, Carl will do that, right, Carl? Hello. I think, yes, sure. Okay, thank you. See if you can do that and uh, <laughs> let me know if there's a, a problem. Sounds good. Um, great idea. Other, other questions, remarks, requests? Um, okay, great. So let me um, go to, I'm going to talk on the board again today. And um, <clears throat> so last time, 
Um, we talked a lot about motivating examples. I'm going to, uh, uh, motivating uh, theorems, I should say, to kind of illustrate the mathematical breadth of this course or the topics um, that we're touching on. I'm going to try to do something a little bit different uh, starting today, which is I'm going to discuss a whole bunch of examples and then we'll st start discussing the general theory. But for me, the general theory and the examples are totally integrated and I'm always visualizing some specific examples when I'm discussing the general theory. Um, so let's, um, let's uh, begin again though with our general setting. So this will be an ergodic theory discussion. So we have a, um, a measure space, um, uh, X, B, M, and uh, I'm going to require that the total measure of X is one. So this is what's called a probability space. And of course, the measures of sets are non-negative. Countably additive, B is a sigma algebra of measurable subsets of X, et cetera. And then um, we have some transformation T from X to X, which is measurable. And, uh, and this has measurable means that if you take a measurable set that is an element of B, then T inverse of A is also measurable. And, uh, and this is not just measurable, but it's measure preserving. And that means that the measure of P inverse of A is equal to the measure of A. Um, and now often, but not always, we will require that T is invertible. And um, in that case, you could just say the measure of T of A is equal to the measure of A. But there are interesting examples where T is not invertible, and we'll see some uh, soon, and, and it's nevertheless uh, measure preserving. A nice way to write this is, uh, that I like, is that if for all functions in L1 of X with respect to its measure, um, you have that the integral of F composed with T is equal to the integral of F. The integral being, of course, with respect to the big measure on, um, on X. And I should say that we can, it, when T is invertible, it really gives us a, um, an action of the integers on X. And more generally, one can discuss when G is, say, a topological group, one can discuss a, um, an action, a measure-preserving action of uh, G um, uh, on X, which is just given by a suitable map from G cross X to X. And um, it should have the property that this map as a whole is measurable. And, uh, and then each individual element uh, should, be, um, should be measure preserving. So we will eventually discuss some actions of discrete groups and even in discrete groups. Okay, now a basic question in ergodic theory where the word comes from is whether or not when you have some dynamics going on on the space X, uh, whether or not you can cut the space into two simpler spaces is that are each individually preserved by T. And uh, if, you're, if that's the case, you aren't really dealing with a primitive dynamical system, but you could simplify your discussion by studying A and B individually. These don't interact at all. And of course, this comes up always in mathematics. When you have a linear transformation on a Hilbert space, you can ask if it's reducible. When you have a group representation, et cetera. And, um, and the, so, so you, hopefully, you can cut down to A and B. And then if these are not yet irreducible, you can cut them down farther. And maybe you finally reach a case where you can't reduce uh, uh, the pieces anymore. Each piece has the property that it has no invariant partition. And when that occurs, we say that the dynamical system is ergodic. So ergodic, in the case of a single transformation, means um, the following. If A is a Braille measurable subset and it's invariant under T, 
then either the measure of A is zero, in which case you might as well neglect it, it's not really participating in the dynamics, or the measure of its complement is zero. And you'll notice that this uh, description doesn't require that you um, that you understand, uh, it, it doesn't, all you need to know for this description is what are the sets of measure zero. So actually this is a very broad notion of ergodicity. It makes sense even when T is not measure preserving. As long as you have a measure, you can ask if it can be broken into invariant sets each of positive measure. If that's not possible, one still says the action is, um, is ergodic. Kurt, the blackboard writing is getting blurry. Oh, okay. Interesting. So there, how's that? Better. I have no idea why that happened. Is it because I got too close to the camera? How is that? Still looks good. Okay. Um, maybe I'm not allowed to walk in front of the blackboard. So, um, so let's, let's go back to our simplest of all dynamical systems, the irrational rotation of the circle, and uh, prove that this is ergodic. Now, there's two things that are fundamental and simple, and once you realize these two things, the proof that it's ergodic is easy. So the first statement is that when you have an irrational rotation of the circle, it has a good topological property, namely every orbit is dense. A dyna topological dynamical system where every orbit is dense is said to be minimal. Again, this is some sort of irreducibility, but in the topological setting. So, so, so let's study now x is x plus a on the circle r mod c where t has infinite order which is the same thing as saying a is not in q or q mod z um, and the first statement is uh, all orbits and by this let me say i mean t of x i'll go forward and backwards uh, call them and call that the orbit of x are dense in the circle. Okay, so why why are all orbits dense? Well, one one nice proof is you consider the closure of an orbit. So the orbit is going around on the circle. Maybe it doesn't reach everything. Well, if you take its closure, what's left over will be a countable collection possibly finite collection of intervals. Now, T leaves invariant the orbit, so it also leaves invariant the complement of its closure. So T permutes these intervals. What can we, can, how can we finish the argument knowing that T permutes these intervals? By the way, preserving their length. Anyone just unmute and yell out an idea. Uh, look at endpoints. Louder? You look at the endpoints. Okay, and then what? Oh, a permutation is finite order. Oh, uh, why is it, it a finite order? order? There's countably many endpoints. I, I can't, this might be a Cantor set, right? So there might be countably many intervals left over. Other thoughts? Oh, but uh, the number of intervals of a given length has to be finite. Great, right. So, so actually, since T is permuting these intervals and T is an isometry, the lengths of the intervals are preserved and there's only finitely many intervals of a given length. So T must be sending these complementary intervals around to others of the same length. And there's only finitely many of those, so after finitely many iterations, it comes back, and then it's evidently the identity of the interval it returned to, and so T is periodic. Okay, so that's a, a proof that the orbits are dense. A, a little ad hoc, there's other ways to do this. Um, another way to prove that the orbit is dense is to, is to think of, um, is to look at the subgroup generated by A. So basically, the orbit of X is a coset of the additive subgroup generated by A. If you take the subgroup generated by A and you take its closure, 
that is itself a topological group inside of the circle. In fact, it can be shown to be a Lie group. And the only Lie subgroups inside the circle are finite groups in the circle itself. They're either zero or one bunch. That kind of argument works for much more general Lie groups. Okay, so that's our first observation. Is, and this is said, he said T is minimal in this case. And then the second thing we're going to do to get measure theory into the picture is uh, we're going to use something called the Lebesgue density theorem. This is one of the few non-trivial theorems in measure theory. Um, so it's, it's, it's comparable in difficulty to the statement that a monotone increasing function on the real line has a derivative almost everywhere. Um, so the Lebesgue density theorem in this case says the following. So let A uh, be contained in the circle, be measurable, Then, for almost every x in A, if you look at the measure of A intersect um, a small interval around this point, and you divide by the length of the interval, that's a measure of the density of, uh, of uh, x inside of this interval, um, that this limit as r goes to uh, zero exists, let's call that the density of at x of a, it exists and it's equal to one. So in other words, you can't make a set of positive measure that everywhere you look at it, it has sort of, it sort of occupies half the point. You can't take half of the points on the circle and form a set consisting of them. Every set of positive measure has the property that if you pick a point at random in the set and you take a, a small enough interval around it, um, then, the, the, then most of that interval is filled up by the set A. Okay, so now it should be pretty clear how to prove um, the statement, which hasn't been written on the board yet, so I'll fit it up here. So the theorem is that uh, T is ergodic, i.e. an irrational rotation of the circle is ergodic. And the proof is, um, well, the words are written down in the notes. So let me not bother with that. Let's do it this way. You pick a point X in A where the density of X of A is equal to one. So that's, that's possible if A has positive measure. So we, we, we look at a T invariant set of positive measure A. And, um, and what we find is some interval around X and that A itself almost fills this interval. It fills 99% uh, uh, 90, 90 of it. So the measure of I intersect A over the measure of i is say greater than one minus epsilon. Epsilon is small. But now we see that if we move this interval to x plus a, that is if we apply t to this transformation, we find another interval where a is very dense. And then an interval of the same length. And then we find another interval where a is very dense. And in fact, these intervals cover the whole circle. And so we can cover the circle with intervals where A has density 1 minus epsilon. Because of the fact that the orbit is dense, and so we can quickly conclude that, for example, the measure of A is greater than or equal to 1 minus 2 epsilon, allowing a little slop just uh, for making the argument easier. And, uh, and since epsilon was arbitrary, this implies that A is full measure. Okay, so this is, I, I, I give the argument this way because there are many, there are actually many proofs of this theorem and we'll do some others later, but this one is very geometric. The idea is just 
you start with a measurable set. You don't, your initial thought is, I don't know anything about a measurable set, but in fact you do. You know statements like little vague density theorem. And then you take the information that you have and you propagate it using the dynamics. How do you do that? You use the fact that the set is invariant. And in this case, that implies this density is invariant. And so, um, and it, it, we're then able to take this one point where the set looks very dense to show it's very dense everywhere and therefore it has full measure. Okay, so that's a proof that the, um, that the irrational rotation is, um, is ergodic. Okay, so now I want, to, I want to make a list of many more examples of measure preserving systems. And as I say, this is partly to have a context for all the general theorems we're going to discuss. It's partly to indicate how the topic branches out to other topics. And it's partly just to show you some various different phenomena that gives rise to measuring measure preserving transformations. So this is, and again, this is more expansive than the notes, but I'll just um, sketch some examples here. So examples of uh, measure preserving T T X. So my first example will be the map T of Z is, actually let's do like we were doing before, T of X is DX on S1, which is R mod Z, where D is uh, greater than one and an integer. So this is the map that takes a circle and it wraps it over itself d times. So it's it's a it's a it's a d to one map. Now you might say that well that map is obviously not measure preserving because if you take an interval here, then it gets mapped to an interval of length d times its original length. But that's not the definition of measure preserving. The definition of measure preserving is that the measure of the pre-image of a set should be the same as it started with. And if you take an interval here of length L, what you'll find is that it has one pre-image of length L over D, but then it has another pre-image of length L over D, and in fact it has D pre-images, each of length L over D. So in fact, this map is measure preserving. That's a typical example of a measure preserving endomorphism. Um, a somewhat more exotic family of maps on the circle, similar in spirit, are the Blaschka products. This brings us into something a little bit related to complex dynamics. Um, so this is a map from the circle to itself, but it's secretly also a map from the unit disk to itself, and it's a map from the Riemann sphere to itself. It has the form B of Z is Z times the product from say two to D of um, Z minus AI over one minus AI bar Z, where AI is in the unit disk. So for me, delta means the set of complex numbers of absolute value less than one the unit disk in the complex plane. And as you can see, this is actually a rational function. It's a simple exercise to prove it preserves the circle. It also preserves the unit disk. And amazingly, this function, which has degree D on the circle, as you might guess, um, this also it, uh, preserves, will make, preserves measure on S1. And uh, notice that when the AIs are all equal to zero, then we get B of Z is Z to the D, which is our first example. So it's a perturbation of the example that we started with. And, uh, and let me just briefly sketch the proof that this is measure preserving. So it's a beautiful fact that if you take a, a the indicator function, of a measurable subset of a circle, say E, that this function, which is one here and zero in the complement, that this extends to a harmonic function 
on the unit disk whose boundary values are this indicator function E, where the boundary has to be interpreted in terms of radial limits. Now, when you do this harmonic extension, what do you think the value of the function is at the origin? You have the mean value principle for, um, for harmonic functions, so what should be the value of u at zero? The measure of the set. Yeah, that's right. If we normalize so that the circle has total measure one, then u of e is uh, at, at zero is just equal to the measure of e. And now we have this beautiful idea that if we take our transformation B, we can pull back this harmonic function to get a new function, UE composed with B. And notice that B of zero is zero because of this Z in front here. And it turns out that U of E of B at zero is equal to the measure of the inverse of E. Because the pre-image of E has an indicator function and the boundary values of ue composed with b are this are just the indicator function of the inverse of e because if a point tends towards a point of the inverse of e then the corresponding point here tends to e and therefore the boundary value is one so since holomorphic maps pull back harmonic functions these Blaschka products are measure preserving. Okay, let's do a much more naive, less analytical uh, class of examples. Um, these are called interval exchange transformations. And we take an interval, let's say it's zero, one, just so that its measure is one. And we cut it up into several subintervals. Let me do four. So we have intervals A, B, C, and D. And then our map sends the unit interval to itself, and it preserves length on each of these intervals. It's just a translation. Uh, but maybe it moves D over here, and then it puts C here, and then it drops in A here, and then it drops in B here. And maybe this ends up being one somehow by magic. These intervals are supposed to be the same length. <laughs> anyway, it per I guess C wasn't long enough. <laughs> okay, let's see if I can make this a little more convincing. Okay. okay, so it takes these intervals, it scrambles them, and then puts them back down within the interval uh, after, after moving them around. This is uh, an example that obviously preserves linear measure on the interval and it's called an interval exchange transformation. Uh, actually, this one's kind of boring because I a, this line between A and B doesn't do anything, so let me change this to B and A. Okay, now, um, as you start iterating this, you'll get finer and finer subdivisions of the interval. The result might be ergodic, it might have dense orbits, who knows? It's quite complicated in general to analyze it, these interval exchange transformations. They're, they're quite rich. On the other hand, these generalize the transformations of a circle. Because if you take the case of two intervals, A and B, and then just swap them, B and A, if this is our interval exchange transformation, what you can see is that's equivalent. We might as well take the two endpoints of this interval and glue them together. So we have A and B, and then we've just moved B to the front. So we translate enough so that we, so the T of B is up here, and then A occupies the rest. So this would be T of A. So an interval which transfer, exchange transformation on two intervals is exactly the same as an irrational rotation, uh, as a rotation, might, might not be irrational. And so these IETs are generalizations of interval exchange, of, uh, of rotations, but they turn out to be very rich. Okay, so now let's come to an example that will really be of great importance to us. Um, 
It's going to have to do with um, with a, an endomorphism or automorphism of group. So I will talk over and over again about the torus. So for me, the torus means um, a d-dimensional torus, which is R d modulo z. So if you like, it's a product of d copies of the unit circle. Um, but it's often nice to think of it as literally a quotient of Euclidean space by the action of translation by the interval lattice. And one occasion where it's nice to think of that is the following. If you let take T to be a um, invertible integral matrix of, uh, of, of rank D, then T gives you a map from RD to itself. Uh, but since its entries are integers, it gives you a map from ZD to itself. It preserves the interval lattice. And moreover, since it's inverse, if you, since it's invertible, its determinant has to be, um, has to be uh, an integer. And on the other hand, uh, that integer has to be one. So, so T inverse is also a matrix of the same type. So this map gives a bijection between the integers and the, uh, it gives a, gives a bijective map on the level of the integers. And it, so it descends to a map on the quotient space, which I'm also going to know, to know by T. So T gives a map from the torus of degree B to itself. And, um, and because of the map, the fact that the determinant of the map um, is plus or minus one, it preserves Lebesgue measure on RD, and so it preserves linear measure on the torus, which is inherited from, from RD. So this is certainly measure preserving. Okay, so each, uh, each integral matrix gives rise to a possibly very rich uh, automorphism of a torus. And in fact, there's no reason to require that the map be invertible if T is a um, is just a d by d matrix with integral entries and the determinant of t is not zero, then t gives a uh, measure preserving endomorphism of the torus. And in, we already saw an example of that in the case of a one-dimensional torus, multiplication by an integer uh, gave the degree d map of the circle to itself. And that was indeed venture preserved. Okay. Now, in a very different spirit, um, let me show you another endomorphism, which has been much studied uh, because of its relation to arithmetic. It's called the uh, Gauss transformation or the continued fraction transformation. Um, and this is the map T from the unit interval to itself that sends t of x to the fractional part of 1 over x. And uh, what this means is, if you like, it's 1 over x mod 1. You throw away the, um, you subtract off the uh, largest integer less than 1 over x. Um, and you know, you might argue this is ill-defined at the origin, et cetera. It uh, doesn't really matter because we're working with measure preserving transformations. Um, so the idea of this transformation is, um, is that um, if you have a, if you happen to know the continued fraction of x, say x is 1 over a1 plus 1 over a2 plus etc., where the ai's are positive integers, then t of x is obtained by flipping this over, which means you erase the top, and then getting rid of this a, because that's an integer. So t of x just gives you the next piece of the continued fraction transformation. So if you, if you iterate t on x and look at where x lands within the interval from 0 to 1, you can read off the continued fraction of x. Um, so that's a close relationship to the continued fraction uh, process. And this mapping, by the way, 
how does it behave? Well, it's, it's um, if, if we look at um, the point one half, let's think about what happens. So near zero, th this function is, um, uh, sorry, what do I want to say? So between, so one goes to, goes to one or zero, if you like. One, but when you're close to one, um, uh, I'm confusing myself. So uh, let's see. So yeah. So between right between one half and one, the the integral part is one. So it's one over x minus one. So it looks like a so one way to think of it is you just draw the graph of one over x. And then you take the pieces and you keep and you slide them down so that they fit within the interval like this. And then they, the, the branch, branches will take place at the reciprocals of the integers. Sorry, there was a comment. Was that consistent with my picture? Yes. Okay, good. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so it's a highly discontinuous map and it stretches a lot. It's very expanding. And it happens, and this is an interesting computation, that uh, T preserves uh, a measure. Uh, the measure M, which is dx over 1 plus x on the interval from 0 to 1. Uh, this measure doesn't have, I don't think I normalized this to have mass 1. It probably has mass log 2. But um, anyway, it preserves this measure, which is not quite a probability measure. And using that fact, together with the fact that it's ergodic, which we haven't proved, but which turns out to be true, plus some theorems that we're going to prove, namely the ergodic theorem, allows you to predict the statistics of the continued fraction expansion of a randomly chosen element on, uh, on the circle. So we may revisit that uh, once we have those theorems in play. Okay, so that was the example of the torus. Um, let me start collecting some of these over here. So we have the torus, we have the continued fraction map. Um, now I want to uh, discuss something very different in spirit to show you that ergodic theory and probability theory are very uh, closely related. So probability theory, probability theory. Um, so for this, um, I, I'm going to take my space x to be r to uh, the natural numbers. So an element of this space will just be a sequence of numbers x0, x1, x2 and so on. And, um, and then uh, I'm going to take my measure to be the product of various measures on the real line from zero to infinity. Uh, am I a measure on R, probability measure on R? And there's a natural way to form this countable product of measures. The measure of a cylinder set is the product of the measures of the factors. And, uh, and then we can think of a randomly chosen point here as being the, a, just a list of numbers where x0 is chosen at random with respect to the measure m0, x1 is chosen at random with respect to the measure m1, etc. So let's do the case where all the mi's are equal to mu, the same measure. So then what we're doing is we're choosing points in the real line over and over again, each randomly with respect to some measure mu. Moreover, since I've taken the product measure here, those points, those, those numbers when regarded as random variables are independent random variables. And so an element here is just the values of a sequence of independent, equally distributed 
uh, random variables. Um, and to make this into a dynamical system, we consider one of the few maps you can think of from X to itself, which is the shift. And this is just a map that does basically the only thing you can imagine. You have a sequence of numbers and you just forget the first one and keep going. And then we can, for, then we can also take a function if we like on X to the real numbers given, which just peels off the first coordinate. And then the values of this function uh, along an orbit are given by f of tix is just the zeroth coordinate after you've shifted by i. So this will be uh, x of i. So we, have, we see we have a setting with a, a measure preserving map and a function or an observable and the values of this observable along an orbit are the same as the values of a sequence of independent random variables, all with the same distribution. Now, there's various theorems about sequences of independent random variables, like flips of a coin. One of them is called the strong law of large numbers. And what it says is that if the expectation of this random variable is finite, and we, we start observing the values of the random variable over and over again, then the values we get, that is f of x, f of tx, et cetera, if we add these together, f of tn minus 1x, and divide by n, that this will converge to the expected value of x, almost surely. That's called the strong law of large numbers, and what you're starting to see here is that this kind of concept from probability theory can be formulated within the context of ergodic theory. And it will turn out that the ergodic theorem uh, will imply the strong law of large numbers, uh, although it will be considerably uh, stronger or, or more general. Um, okay. Let me move, let me just say for those who know, there's something called the Kolmogorov zero one law. And uh, this says that if you make a statement about the, um, if you make a statement about the, uh, this sequence of variables and the statement doesn't depend on the value of any particular variable. So for example, you say, x of i is positive for infinitely many i. That's the truth or falseness of that doesn't depend changing on the value of x2, that the answer to any such question is either yes or no, almost surely. There's no fluctuation in the behavior of these, of these tail events. The probability is either zero or the probability is one. And that's a manifestation of the ergodicity of this system. I have improved the ergodicity, but that's one of the ways ergodicity appears in uh, probability theory. Okay, so this was um, so independent random variables. Okay, next, um, I think just to, to lighten things up a little, let's do something much simpler. Let's take um, the, uh, the full shift. Uh, so um, this is the full shift on n symbols can be thought of as um, you take z mod n or any other set of cardinality n to the z. So this is just a sequence of um, it's just a sequence of, of numbers which range from zero to n minus one, but by infinite. So an element here has a value x minus two, x minus one, x zero, x one, etc. And now the shift, which will be our transformation t, is a bijection. So sigma of x sub i is x sub i plus one. 
And uh, our measure is um, uniform measure on Z mod N. And, uh, and then, um, uh, and then the product of those measures. Oh, Kurt, so someone's asking if the camera right. angle's getting low. Oh, is the camera okay. angle getting low? It... Am I, uh, it's not low for me. Is it low for you? I, I can see all oh, the writing. Yeah. There are like two, two screens. Okay. Sorry? It, it, it's the, the other camera. I looked at the wrong camera. Ah, okay. Okay, thank We're you. Good? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, um, um, hi, um, so here's a question. So in the right, um, right lower corner, uh, what does that almost surely go to? You write, you write the average and then almost surely it goes to what is, what is the X? Yeah, right. So this is just an, an, an this is just a um, notation from probability theory. So um, we have a, a, what's a random variable, a single random variable? It's given by a measure on the real line. So a random variable means I tell you for any interval A, what is the probability that the random variable is in this interval A? Oh, so just expectation of X. And, yeah, so this means the expectation value. And so my measure was mu, and so the expected value of x is the integral over the whole real line of the value x with respect to the measure mu. Great, thanks. I saw it means exercise or something, so thanks. Yeah, right. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Expectation value of x. Other questions? I do try to sort of freely move between the languages used in a couple of different disciplines. And so please stop me uh, if there's any, um, anything that's uh, not familiar to you. Okay, so here's another system where we just, uh, we choose um, uh, finite num numbers at random and then shift them. And, uh, and uh, for, for example, um, when n is two, this is just an infinite sequence of zeros and ones uh, and each zero or one is the outcome of an independent coin flip. That's the way to think of the, of the measure. So it's a random, by infinite random sequence of uh, zeros and ones. And, uh, and I want to, one of the reasons I wanted to put this up is there's a related transformation called the Baker's transformation. I once went to high rise and brought in some fresh dough to represent that, represent this, sorry, to give you the low budget version. So the Baker's transformation is this. You take the unit square in R2 and you cut it into two pieces like this, A and B. So these are each rectangles. And then you take A and um, and you, 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 you compress its height, but at the same time, you stretch its length so that, so that its area remains preserved. So you put A over here like this, and then you do the same thing with B, and you put it on top. Okay, so this gives you, this is, the idea of this is like you're, you're kneading dough. You cut the dough into two pieces, stack them, push them down so that it's back to the same shape, then you cut it in half, push them down, etc. And I think you can imagine that as you iterate this process, if you had a little piece of, of um, if you had a little piece of chocolate inside of this piece of dough, well, it would get, first it would get stretched out here. But then when we, the next time we cut, it would be in both A and B. And so then it would be stretched out here and here. And as you keep going, it would get stretched out and evenly distributed through all of the dough. Um, so in fact, this transformation is ergodic. And that wasn't a proof, but it's an idea of what an ergodic transformation looks like. Uh, this is ergodic with respect to the vague measure. And in fact, it's even better. It's what's called mixing which was this 
property I just mentioned about the chocolate. So let me, let me just mention this. It's another property we can look for in a measure preserving transformation. What this means is that if you take any two sets, A and B, then measurable sets, then the measure of A intersect the ith inverse image of B tends to the measure of A times the measure of B. Now, of course, this statement is vacuous if A or B have, uh, have zero measure. But in the interesting case, it, um, it says that, that B gets stretched out and spread around the space so evenly that the proportion of B that's inside of A is, pro is proportional to the measure of A. And that's called mixing. And um, for example, is the irrational rotation mixing? Let's have a quick yes or no so I can see if I can bring up my participants list. So please click yes or no if you think the irrational rotation is mixing. This is like a poll in one of Mike Sandel's ethics classes. Still some undecideds out there. That's good for November. Okay, so the overwhelming majority think it's not mixing. In fact, um, I think I saw some people defect from the, from the mixing category. Uh, so if you voted not mixing, um, uh, raise your hand if you want to explain why the irrational rotation is not mixing. Okay, I only see one raised hand, so I'll wait just a second for other people to raise their hands. Please try to participate. <laughs> Okay, two raised hands. Nice. Okay, so I, I'm, I'm gonna... Um, <laughs> okay, so let me ask uh, um, uh, Ding Ding Dong, can you tell me uh, why the irrational rotation is not mixing? Oh, I just figured that um, there's a chance A and um, the inverse image of B don't overlap. Well, suppose um, A is very long, A and B are both very long, then they always have to overlap. Um, um, I, I think on the board it wasn't clear that N goes to infinity. Uh, it's oh, like just I'm sorry. Uh -huh. so this should be as I goes to infinity. Thank you, Tina. Right. So that um, so my question was my question was a slightly facetious about what if they're not very long. Actually, the the statement is that for all measurable sets A and B, this limiting property has to hold. So, um, Ding Ding, I think your, your objection was exactly right. If you take one fixed interval A on the circle, and it's fairly short, and you take another interval B, well then, even if they both have positive measure, since the orbit of the center of this interval is dense, there will be infinitely many values of I such that this is empty here. And so it can't possibly mix. So that's, that's right. Um, on the other hand, if we were to have taken the transformation t of x is 2x mod 1, what would have happened? Well, if we took a given set A, then its pre-image, let's say it's a little interval, its pre-image under t to the i would be 2 to the i intervals each of length, the original length of A divided by 2 to the i. So there'd be lots of little copies of 
this original interval A, and they're becoming evenly spread throughout the, the, the circle. And so the proportion that intersect another interval B actually tends to a multiple of the measure of B as I goes to infinity. So in fact, the irrational rotation is not mixing, but the doubling map mod one is a mixing transformation. And it turns out, and it's not hard to show, that the Baker's transformation is also mixing. Okay, now why do I put the Baker's transformation and the shift next to each other? Well, suppose we were to consider the two shift, and we wanted to make a picture of what the points in the two shift are. So a point in the two shift is an infinite sequence of numbers that are either zero or one, Suppose it, instead of writing them like this, I write them like, like this, x3, x2, x1, and then I write y1, y2, y3, etc. If I do that, then there's a natural map from the two shift to the unit square. Namely, I just send the, this point here to the point whose binary expansion is 0 point x1, x2, x3, etc. And then its y coordinate is 0 point y1, y2, y3, etc. And then what, what happens when you apply the two shift is that, is that this coordinate shifts off and moves over to become part of the y coordinate. So the new x coordinate under the shift map becomes 0 point x2, x3, etc. And then the new y coordinate becomes point x1, y1, y2, etc. And so in fact, the full two shift as a measurable dynamical system is isomorphic to the Baker's transformation acting on the square. So this is a nice way to visualize what's going on with geometrically with the two shift. Um, okay. You get a, wait, do you get a problem with that isomorphism from the fact that like those binary expansions aren't, aren't unique? Sorry, louder? Do you get any problems from the fact that those binary expansions aren't unique? Well, good question. So, so there's a lot of times in math where people bluff over the fact that binary expansions, decimal expansions are not unique. There used to be, probably before you were born, something called a news group on the internet. One of the groups was called rec.mathematics. <laughs> and I would say half the traffic was people discussing whether or not 0.99999 is actually equal to one. Okay, so indeed, there are multiple possible definitions of binary expansions. Here, we've chosen sort of canonical binary expansions. The question was, does that cause any trouble with the measurable conjugacy? Does anybody want to address that? I think I feel that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Ethan. I was just going to say that um, for, a measure, for an isomorphism between measurable dynamical systems, we don't care about what happens on a set of measure zero. That's right. So, so I, I mean, I actually, I, I, there might be something sloppy here. It, it, this, so you could argue, and, and I think quite correctly, that I didn't define the map T in the case of the Baker's transformations. I didn't tell you what to do when you're on the boundary between A and B. And then there's a picky uni question of, well, uh, how are you going to you know, break the symmetry, et cetera? And, and once you've done that, will it literally be conjugate to this thing here? And so, so actually, when we say that these two things are isomorphic, it's probably better to say there's sets of full measure for both dynamical systems that can be put in bijection in such a way that the dynamics can be can used. For example, it's easy to take a transformation that has no periodic points and add in a single point that's fixed and has measure zero. Well, that's now a different dynamical system, literally speaking. But since that point has measure zero, it's kind of irrelevant. 
And when to take that into account when discussing isomorphism, we only need isomorphisms on sets of full measure to preserve um, uh, ergodic theory properties. Okay, so here's a little remark about another place uh, measure preserving maps come from. I'm going to start to move into a more algebraic direction. Um, so there's not very many automorphisms of the complex plane that are given by polynomials. Only linear polynomials map the complex plane bijectively to itself. But there are lots of automorphisms of, uh, of uh, say, C2 to itself. So let's say this is a polynomial automorphism, meaning that T inverse is also, it's a bijection, and T inverse is also given by polynomials. And a typical such map might be xy goes to xy plus any polynomial you like written down in terms of x. And it's a beautiful fact that when you have a polynomial automorphism that the determinant of the derivative of t, in other words, the Jacobian, well, this is also a polynomial. But if this is a, um, an automorphism, then this polynomial uh, has to be nowhere vanishing. There can't be any branching in the map T. So it's a, no, a polynomial with no zeros. That sounds bad. The only such polynomials are constants. So the determinant of DT is a constant. And, um, and so up to scale, you can arrange that T uh, preserves Lebesgue measure on C2. And so polynomial automorphisms provide an abundant source of, uh, of maps that preserve measure on both C2 and R2. And let me just mention that there's one called the Hanon map. Uh, I won't discuss it in detail, but it has been discussed very widely. Um, it was one of the first concrete examples of an invertible map that was shown to have lots of string detractors. Um, so one thing I do want to mention is that um, there's an open problem here called the Jacobian conjecture. Uh, which is which is a um, which is a converse to uh, this theorem, uh, namely uh, if um, does the statement that the determinant of dt equals a constant imply that t has a polynomial inverse? Oddly enough, this turns out to be a a, a difficult open problem. I wouldn't start working on it too hard. I think it's been solved in a, up to 100 variables. Um, it's probably true, but it remains an open problem. But what, I wanted, what I'm illustrating here is that in algebraic situations, there's often some kind of unexpected rigidity. And for some reason, the volume form on C2 is invariant under the automorphism group of C2 up to scale, at least. And we'll see that again and again in other algebraic dynamical systems. Um, so maybe I'll, I'll, um, I'll conclude uh, or just make sure I get them in today uh, to a couple, another class of examples coming from algebra. So another example is um, that if, uh, let's say X, is CG modulo lambda is a compact complex torus. And uh, T from X to X is, say, a, a holomorphic automorphism. Uh, then, um, well, it turns out that this implies that when you lift T to the universal cover, up to translation, it's just given by a linear map. And since it's an automorphism, it has to preserve the total measure, so its Jacobian has to be one. So this implies um, that T is measure preserving. And, and it also implies that T is very simple. It's just a linear map, uh, or, or possibly a translation. 
Um, now the thing about these compact complex tori is that we sometimes encounter a complex torus. In fact, even the simplest case of a, of a Riemann surface of genus one, we often encounter these in a, in a setting where we can't see very easily the group structure. And, and a nice example of that is what I call the bow tie. So to, to be very concrete, um, we look at the locus in R2 given by a certain equation, one plus x squared times one plus y squared plus, and then there's a constant you can play around with, axy is equal to three. And I'm gonna draw the case where a is equal to seven. Um, what this looks like is, um, is sort of like this. somewhat bad drawing, but approximately right. You can see the picture in the notes and on the web page. Um, and this curve that I've drawn has the property that when you draw a vertical line, it meets the curve in exactly two points, unless of course you go through a tangent. But typically it meets the curve in two points, and that's because this equation is quadratic in x. If you, if, uh, uh, quadratic in y. If you fix x, it's quadratic in y. If you fix y, it's quadratic in x. That means a vertical line meets it in two points and a horizontal line meets it in two points. And so we have an involution on this curve defined by just swapping two points while keeping their x-coordinate fixed. And then we have another involution defined by swapping two points and keeping their y coordinates fixed. And so we can consider the transformation T where we compose these two. We first swap the x coordinates, then we swap the y coordinates, then we swap the x coordinates, then we swap the y coordinates, and you get, to get a, a little dynamical system going. Oops, that was implausible. Um, and it you can, and you can see some orbits of this. I'll show you in a second uh, from the web page. But the question is, how does this transformation behave acting on this curve, x? And the answer is provided by the fact that, in fact, in C2, or even better, in the complex projective space, this equation, star, defines a, a, an elliptic curve, a curve of genus G equals one. So the complex points of this, uh, uh, defined by this equation, are actually isomorphic to our torus, C mod lambda, by the general theory of Riemann surfaces. And then the real points of this curve are, are a circle on this torus. And um, these involutions acting on the torus have the form in the group law on the torus, uh, just uh, z goes to say lambda one minus z, and i y of z is lambda two minus z for some lambda one and lambda two. And then what you'll find is that, is that their product, uh, which is our transformation t, T of x, T of z, is just translation on the torus. So it's z plus maybe lambda 2 minus lambda 1 minus lambda 2, something like this. Um, and so what happens is, on this real locus, you're simply doing a translation along a circle in the coordinates provided by the uniformization of the torus. So this strange looking algebraic map is actually conjugate to an irrational rotation. Okay, so the irrational rotation can occur in a very disguised fashion uh, as a consequence of algebra. And for example, it's not at all clear what the metric is with respect to which this map is an isometry, and that metric comes from the nowhere vanishing holomorphic one form, which exists on any curve of genus one. Um, okay, so just briefly, the, the, the re reason this worked 
was because the equation I wrote down was of degree two in each variable individually. So I could, I could, why stop there? Why don't we go to three dimensions and write down something, say, like this. And then what we would get is some sort of, some sort of ball-like shape in three space, and with each court we can move up and down. There's an involution in the x direction, an involution in the y direction, and an involution in the z direction, and we can let t be the product of those three involutions. And this, in fact, gives an area-preserving map on this surface, just like this one gave a map that preserved some sort of metric along this curve. And in both cases, that preservation comes from the fact that there's a nowhere vanishing one form here and there's a nowhere vanishing two form here. This turns out to be what's called a K3 surface with some kind of generalization of an elliptic curve. And you could go to four or more dimensions and you'd be talking about kalabi yao manifolds, et cetera, et cetera. But I want to keep it down to earth and just illustrate for you that there's some very concrete examples coming from algebra that preserve measures, and in fact, one of them is just our good old irrational rotation in disguise. So let me let me um, flip to the web page now, just to illustrate these um, dynamical systems. Um, okay, so I, I hope some of you have looked at this already. Um, I, I, I intend to keep updating the web page and add interesting graphics if something interesting comes up. So let me share this. Um, okay, so, um, right, so this picture here, this is a much better drawing of, um, of the bow tie. And um, this, this it, 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 I'm almost certain, I mean, it's, it's true with high probability that the dynamical system you're seeing here, which should really be thought of as you go down and over, down and over. Let me just turn on annotate. And um, does this work? Spotlight. Um, anyway, the, uh, maybe I'll turn on mouse. So you just go down and over, et cetera, that this, the orbits are dense and that they're preserving a, a, a linear measure of some sort on this circle. You can see that the points get very close together near the neck of the bow tie and farther apart near the long uh, flat pieces. Um, and when we go to, to two dimensions, to the setting of a K3 surface, um, which is shown here, we get an area preserving map on, um, on a space that's topologically a ball. So, so what I'm drawing in this picture are just the orbits of randomly chosen points uh, on this ball. So let me ask a question. So here we have an area, area preserving map on a compact space. We can normalize the volume form, so the area is one. Is this map ergodic? What did people think? This can be our, our final um, poll for today. So let me, let me clear all the yeses and noes. So vote yes if you think this map is ergodic and no if you think it's not. Kurt, can I ask a question? Yes. Um, what are these uh, like simple closed curves on the wall? Right, right, what are they? So I, I already, the, the way the picture is drawn, is you take a bunch of randomly chosen points and for each point you draw say 10,000 points in its forward orbit under the map. Okay, so I'm seeing some confident looking no's. Um, so can one of the no's, uh, it, if, you, if you voted no and you want to explain why, can you please raise your hand?
Yes, Vinka. So at the very least, it doesn't look ergodic because it you can take a small that that region uh, with the uh, curves down the bottom left and uh, take B to be the entire rest of the uh, the surface. Yes. And they, 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 they will, well, they have both have positive measure and they, uh, they are a T uh, inverse invariant. That's, that's absolutely right. So, so in fact, what's happening here, although it's not quite obvious, is that at the center of these nested sequences of circles, there's a fixed point for the map, or perhaps a, a, a point of small period, maybe period four. And then nearby, there are, uh, there's a circle which is mapped into itself. And the area bounded by that circle gives a little pocket on the surface, or maybe four of them, one in each corner, um, such that those pockets are just permuted by the action of the map. So we don't have uh, ergodicity. On the other hand, there's this part of the picture, starting in the middle, where at ran the orbit looks very chaotic. And in fact, it turns out that that dark gray part, kind of uh, granular part, is the orbit of just one point. So it looks like there's one point whose orbit fills out a set of positive measure, possibly a closed set of positive measure. And so it may very well be that although this map is not ergodic, that it has a subset of positive measure where the dynamics is ergodic. And this potential mixing of stable and unstable behavior or chaotic and, and uh, predictable behavior is actually typical of, um, of area preserving maps. Um, okay, so, so um, next time I will, uh, I will um, go on to general theory and maybe add in one or more uh, examples. Um, so please take a look at the reading, which will be chapters one through three. And, um, and we'll pick up again next time and also assign, um, come up with some homework problems. Um, great, so I'll leave the, the room open for anyone who wants to chat. Hi, um, so I, I, I heard you mentioned about the case for services near the end. Could you say a little bit more about the relations um, to case for services? <laughs> 